Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the best recordings of Brahms' first symphony after many requests. And I have waited to do this particular video, as I have most of the Brahms symphonies, except for the third, which I think needs special pleading because it's the one that most conductors screw up, at least most frequently. Now, the first, on the other hand, often gets done very, very well. So there are, first of all, just a billion really good performances. And I know that no matter how many I list, and I've got 16 of them here or more, we'll talk about some others too, someone's going to say, well, you forgot to mention that, or you didn't do this, or you, you neglected that. So let's be clear, friends. I forget nothing, ever. Some things I don't mention because you have to draw the line somewhere. And if I draw the line somewhere, that's where the line gets drawn. And if you have something that you want to discuss that I didn't mention, that's fine. I welcome that. However, and there's always a however, if you're going to talk about something that I don't talk about, the whole point of these discussions is to is to enlighten all of us about music, musical interpretation, musical performance, everything about music. I'm not interested, and neither is anybody else, in somebody who simply says, you forgot, bleh, or a two-word, you know, uh, uh, pick a Kusevitsky, question mark? Like, why didn't you? I don't go there. I read every single comment. I think they're fascinating. I really enjoy reading the comments. Lots of other people do. And I flatter myself to think that one of the reasons the comments are so enjoyable is because I am rather liberal with the delete button and I get rid of the crap. And comments like that fall into the crap category. I'm telling you right now, if you have nothing musical, musically valuable to offer other than just a name, <laughs> or an accusation, you forgot this, you didn't say that. Just don't waste my time and don't waste anyone else's time. It's very, very tedious to have to go through these things and delete all these silly remarks. Say something. If you love it, tell us why. Give us a musical factoid that we could all latch on to and maybe some people will want to discuss it. Maybe some people will want to reply to you. But say something of musical substance, please. I'm asking you very, very kindly because it's just, that's what makes these comments so interesting. And that's what makes the wider discussion after I do the video worth looking at. Remember, we are creating a record for future generations. Who knows? Maybe aliens in a distant galaxy will be watching this channel in the next 30 trillion years before entropy snuffs out the expanding universe. I mean, maybe some other people will read these comments and get something of value. So, you know, I mean, I'm doing them for you because I hope you get something of value, but I want you to be in the same frame of mind because you do have something to contribute. We all do. We all have our own unique fund of experience that we bring to the table. And it's silly to waste it if I just, if I just you know, if I blather, you know? Blather, I mean, I get to do blather, it's my channel. But otherwise, let's, let's stay focused and let's give people interesting musical observations. That's my plea because I think that especially when we're talking about a work like this, which has so many recordings and such a recording history and so many big name conductors, there's so many things that we could talk about and we only have time to do so much. So your comments are a wonderful supplement if you want them to be. And I certainly want them to be. So there we are. Now, let's start talking about the performances. As I said, I have about 16 of them. And one of the reasons that I've also hesitated doing this is because most recordings of the first or of Brahms symphonies generally now are just available in boxes or in sets. And it, I, I, I hesitate a little bit because if you like one performance in one set, you're gonna to have to get all the others number one, and number two, unless you can get it somehow on a streaming service separately, and number two, um, if you, most conductors who are fabulous at one of them will be fabulous at the others. And I was a little bit hesitant in, 
in doing all of these symphonies because you just wind up with the same list of people, maybe in a different order. But essentially, you get the same list of people over and over again because the great recordings are the great recordings. They are what they are. And, you know, and I was hesitant to do that because I thought it would look a little dull. But again, not everybody's looking at all of them all at once, and I'm going to space them out a little bit. And so, okay, all right, we'll just do it, and we're going to let the chips fall where they may. And quite a few conductors have recorded these works multiple times, and where they have multiple great performances recorded multiple times, I feel obliged to mention both of them, or all 20 of them, or whatever it is. So although I have 16 recordings, it's a spread, they're spread out about maybe a dozen conductors or so. And you should be aware of that, too. So here we go, Brahms, Symphony Number no. 1, that great, glorious homage to the Beethoven of the Fifth Symphony, which that, that was Brahms's proximate inspiration, even though he did it very differently and spent about 20 years working on it. You know, I had a little theory about what finally, he finally impelled him to dislodge the First Symphony from his his writing desk where it had been sitting forever gathering dust, or at least to push, put the finishing touches on it and release it. And this is my theory, and I know it, it has nothing to do with reality, but I just like it. You know, you know, Brahms was on the um, committee, along with Henslick and some other guys of the day, to give the Austrian State Prize to budding composers. And one of the guys who got the Austrian State Prize was Dvorak. Now, the influence of Dvorak on Brahms and Brahms on Dvorak is a very controversial topic. And because of the, the nationalist and political um, issues involved and the academic history of musicology as a largely German invention and pursuit, German composers are always given primacy of place in musical analysis. I mean, our whole system of musical analysis and, and you know, from the academic perspective is essentially a German invention, and it was invented to favor, to privilege German composers, nobody more than Brahms. And so the relationship between Brahms and Dvorak usually goes one way. Dvorak was the cute, humble, adorable little pat, pat, pat Czech peasant who, who sat at the feet of the great Brahms and, and you know, sucked up whatever he needed to and became a better, more classical, more Brahmsian style composer. But the reality is very, very different. I've written essays on it. I've published some papers on the influence of Dvorak on Brahms, especially with respect to Dvorak's Third Symphony, which is which is audibly indebted to, I mean, with Brahms's Third Symphony, let's be clear, which Brahms' symphony is audibly indebted to Dvorak's fifth. But here's the point. The point is that Dvorak's first five symphonies were all composed before Brahms' first appeared. And Dvorak had submitted the existing ones. The first had disappeared in Dvorak's lifetime and only popped up later. But numbers two, three, four, and five were all submitted for the Austrian prize, or at least three, four, and five were. And they have wonderful things in them. Three is a masterpiece. Four is a transitional kind of work. But five, five is a fully fledged romantic symphony taking Beethoven as the classical model, doing exactly the thing that Brahms himself wanted to do with the symphony. Now, Brahms was moving in the same direction, and he'd already written his first symphony, which was probably sitting in a cupboard somewhere. But I happen to think or speculate, just for the fun of it, that that Dvorak was looking at all this dreck that was coming and being submitted for the Austrian State Prize, and in pops Dvorak's Fifth Symphony, and it must have shocked him. It really must have, because here was a composer who was doing exactly what he wanted to do aesthetically, and was doing it with complete, total mastery, coming out of nowhere, out of the backwoods of Czechoslovakia or the Czech lands. And Brahms must have just went, holy crap, if this guy can do it, you know, why am I sitting on my first symphony? Why am I, what am I waiting for? And so out it popped. Anyway, that's my, that's my ideal hypothesis. There is no way to prove it. And I, you know, I don't think there's any point in trying to prove it. I just like it because I think it, it tells us that 
you know, we really don't know very much about what goes on in these people's minds and what they saw and what they heard and why they did what they did. And so much of the speculation about it is, is, is influenced by other political ideological considerations that have nothing to do with what the reality was. Nothing whatsoever. So anyway, whether or not that's true doesn't matter. Let's talk about the recordings. First and foremost, for great Brahms ones, and this one is going to be a somewhat curious choice, I'm sure you'll find, Leopold Stokowski with the London Symphony. You know, people always underrate Stokowski in the German repertoire, and sometimes with good reason, because his Brahms third made my list for worst ever. I mean, it's absolutely grotesque, and and he could be. You never knew what you were going to get with him. He could rewrite the whole thing. He could have added, you know, all kinds of fun instruments that Brahms never thought about, like piccolos and tam-tams and God knows what. You never knew what he was going to do. But his late recordings of the Brahms symphonies, I mean, he did them a zillion times. I mean, he made the first ever Brahms cycle with Philadelphia back in the old, old, early, early, early days. And he did a wonderful talk on the, with those things. So he did a little chat about Brahms loved melodies so much that he included lots of them in every symphony. That was his talk on Brahms. Basically, that was the whole thing. <laughs> it was it's unbelievable. Anyway, I, you know, Brahms, uh, Stokowski was a contemporary of Brahms. He knew Brahms. He spent his, I don't mean personally, I mean, he knew the style, the aesthetic. He was raised in it. He, he, he conducted this stuff all of his life and was more than capable of turning in astoundingly great Brahms within his, his unbelievably, you know, rich, yummy, late romantic, juicy sort of fach. But he could do it, and he did it really well, and he does a really terrific first symphony here with the LSO. Now, I have to tell you something about this recording. This is the, the two, this is two boxy Stokowski edition, um, which is Decca Recordings 64 to 75. Um, this was volume two. There were two volumes of it. Of course, Decca released this thing, this big box, which was Stokowski, the complete Decca Recordings, and the Brahms first isn't in it. And I started to do this talk. This is like the, my second pass at this talk because I started with this, just assuming that it says, oh, the complete deck of recording, so it's in here. And as I was chatting, I'm looking at the back, looking for the Brahms for a symphony, going, oh, my goodness. It's not in here. It's not in there. They left it out. Those jerks, they always do something like that. It just drives me crazy. Happily, the Brahms first is also available, or was, and I'm sure it's still findable, um, on Kala, you know, the Leopold Stokowski label that licensed a lot of the DECA stuff and has a lot of live and historical recordings, too. It's coupled with the, uh, the Elgar Enigma variations with the Czech Philharmonic, which is wonderful because the Elgar Enigma variations in here is just all by itself on one disc, which doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, you know, what, what these major labels do with their, with their patrimony is just criminal, absolutely criminal. But this is a great Brahms first. It's rich, it's yummy, but it's exciting, and he doesn't monkey with it too much. And it, he takes it seriously and plays it seriously. Of course, Stokowski took everything he did seriously and played everything seriously, no matter how bizarre it was. But this is really a fine Brahms first from somebody who really knew the style and doesn't get any credit for it. And I think uh, for that reason, it's definitely worth mentioning. Next, oh, we're staying with Decca a little bit. Schulte. I've always said this for all that I have been a tremendous critic of a lot of Schulte's work, especially in Chicago, because I think he was in many ways uh, a, a rather facile conductor and somebody who didn't have a lot of, a lot of ideas. I mean, you know, basic musical ideas. His Brahms is terrific. His Brahms is one of the best things he ever did. He really had it down. The only issue that some people have with these symphonies is that he tends to take the slow movements rather slowly. And I don't have a problem with that. They're extremely beautifully done. But this is really exciting and, and beautifully played and warm and, and vibrant and humane and terrific. And it's so much better than so much of the stuff he got famous for. You know, Schulte was, was known as the you know, blockbuster conductor, but I don't think he was that. He didn't really like 
loud sounds. He wasn't good at making them. He usually let the orchestra just get vulgar, out of control when the noise came along. And I think Brahms gave him a certain level of discipline that he really kind of needed and benefited from. And, and he does, there are four superb performances in here. There are no duds. There really aren't. So Schulte is definitely somebody worth considering. Also worth considering is somebody who, whose Brahms gets poo-pooed, perhaps unfairly, is Carrion. Now, Carrion's Brahms gets dumped on because he just did it so many times. And, and it's very similar each time he do, did it. I mean, he didn't change very much from the early days to the later days, number one. And number two, Brahms was the Fort Fengler specialty in many ways, and Fort Fengler hated Carrion. And so some of that hatred and loathing has stuck with Carrion ever since, and it didn't help that he was a Nazi. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons to, to keep the stigma um, on Herbert von Carrion. But Carrion's Brahms is really pretty good. It's much better than his, his Beethoven, I think, in many respects, because he doesn't, um, well, he, he doesn't gum up the works in the same way that he does in music of the classical repertoire, you know, with that heavy, heavy, heavy string sound and thick, oily legato. I mean, there was a period um, when Carrion, Carrion's sort of middle period, when everything he did sounded like that. But this Brahms first is his last one. It's the digital cycle. And again, Carrion's digital cycles of remakes are generally, generally disparaged. It's certainly true of the Beethoven. But I think in the Brahms, he, you know, his... Maybe it was because his grip on the Berlin Philharmonic was loosening, or maybe it was just that, you know that that he didn't he didn't feel the need after that late stage to impose such a a, a a high gloss on everything that he did. I don't know. For whatever reason, the texture started to maybe the sonics, the texture started to to uncloggle just a little bit more. And the result is entirely beneficial. His last Brahm cycle is a beautiful Brahm cycle. It really is in many respects. It's, it's very well played, obviously, and exciting and intelligent. And I think his first, in his, at the last one he did, is, 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 a, is a moving statement, a very, very fine and moving statement, and a, sort of a final affirmation of his pedigree in the standard German repertoire, which of course he considered himself to be the king of, but he wasn't. He really did everything else better than a lot of the German music. So it's great to hear some terrific German music coming from Karajan in Berlin, but this is the last digital one which was recorded, wait a minute, in 1987. There it was. And for some reason that I don't understand, this twofer includes the analog fourth from 79 or 78, I think it is, yeah. And and the digital everything else. It's also a very good fourth, by the way. But still, if you if you care about Karyan and want to hear his approach to Brahms, all I'm saying is get his last ones, get the digital ones. And I mean, they've all been now remastered. The sounds cleaned up from their screechy original releases. And I, they're very, very fine performances. They really, really are. And we have to give him credit where credit is due. Now, in the sort of sleeper department, and there are a couple of those coming up, I have to mention Antal Dorati. You know, Dorati is one of those guys who we tend to ignore, especially in the German repertoire, because he was famous for doing like the Nutcracker and Stravinsky ballets. He was a ballet conductor, but this is really a very good Brahms cycle. It's with the, the London Symphony and the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra. Now, the Minneapolis one is the second and it may be the weakest of the bunch because the Minneapolis Symphony just wasn't a fabulous orchestra. They're okay. They, they get the job done. But the LSO recordings are demonstrably better. And this first is really, really very fine. You know, Dorati in Germanic repertoire, I like it because it's refreshing. It doesn't sound German. I don't mean that in, a, in an unidiomatic way. What I mean is his, his interpretations are usually swift and trenchant. And, and he really hits those, those fabulous bass lines that are always so important in this music. And he's got Mercury's really extra, super up close, vivid sonics to, go, to really unpack Brahms's dense textures. Fun to listen to and completely different. You're not going to hear Brahms done this way by anybody else in this pile, however varied the selections are. It's terrific Brahms playing and, and 
smart interpretations, and I, they deserve credit. They really deserve some credit. So Dorati is somebody you should consider. Also, absolutely essential in my view, Dohnani and Cleveland, totally great and better than George Sell. This is all in a little box now, a Warner box, but um, this is one of the earlier issues. And this has Symphonies 1 and 2 and the Academic Festival and Tragic Overtures. These are amazing Brahms performances. Now, I know that Zell always gets the credit for doing like all the great stuff in Cleveland, but Zell's Brahms does not appear here and will not because I find his Brahms to be, I mean, for all the magnificent playing and intelligence and all the usual Zell things, to be just a touch over controlled and rigid. Now, that's me. I know some of you have said that you love it, and that's fine if you love it, because as, as always with Zell, the musical values are impossible. And here I am talking about Zell and holding up Dohnani, and that's the history of Dohnani in Cleveland. Dohnani said it himself, we give a great performance and Zell gets a great review. <laughs> that's what, that was Dohnani's rueful remark, and it's still true in Cleveland. It's really astonishing the effect that man had. But Dohnani's Dvorak 789 and his Brahms symphonies and a bunch of other things that George Zell did are every bit as good as anything Zell ever did. And they're much better recorded. And the orchestra sounds stunning. And I really think we need to give the credit where credit is due. Dohnani was in many ways a very, very similar conductor. He was not the kind of guy who was going to emote all over everything. He had a... A, a, a rather cool aesthetic, aesthetic uh, approach to a lot of music. He was fabulous at contemporary music. He was a Brahms the progressive guy, if you want to cite Schoenberg. But you, these are such wonderfully clear, clean, beautifully shaped, fabulously played, totally, totally elegant recordings of the Brahms symphonies. I, it's one of my absolute favorite cycles. It may be my favorite cycle. I don't know. It's just way up there. Way, 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 way up there. And you, you, you really should hear them. They are magnificent, absolutely magnificent. So Dohnani and Brahms is a big deal. Also a big deal, Gunter Wand. Now, Gunter Wand did two complete Brahms cycles, plus there are some additional symphonies. There's an extra first symphony with a Chicago symphony he did um, that is really very, very good, but it's quite similar to this one and not as well recorded. This is his first Brahms cycle. This is with NDR, with North German Radio. They both were, actually. Um, the second one was a little bit more wayward, but this one, the first one, is fantastic. They were recorded in 1982 and 83. So you know, it's just two discs. I don't know if you can find them anymore. I, you know, this stuff is impossible. Now, Vons Brahms is very, very interesting. His first symphony particularly because it's, it's you know, Vons said, to, said, you know, in interviews, he said, you know, I, I, I'm not a conductor of an old school, of the old school. I'm an old conductor of the new school. He was a... Toscanini, you know, acolyte and modern music guy for much of his early career before he became the grand old man and, and endless Bruckner person. And so, you know, but he was a marvelously gifted conductor. And now that he's gone, he's tended to be sort of shunted away in everything except Bruckner and forgotten. But boy, he was great in Beethoven. He was great in Brahms. And his first symphony is a shocker because he takes the poco sostenuto indication at the beginning of the first movement um, very literally. It's very, very quick. And, you know, the timpani part is only marked forte. I mean, he really pays attention to all the dynamics. So instead of this grand exordium, which I love, I mean, I'm a grand exordium guy. He's like, bum, 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 da, 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 da. You know, it just, just flies along. Um, not that it's, it's unimposing, but it will shock you if you hear it. And so I really feel that it's kind of unnecessary to talk about Toscanini's recordings, although he was more of a grand exordium guy too, by the way. Um, when we have this sort of acolyte Toscanini performance type guy here doing it in much better sound, wonderfully, wonderfully well. This is an exciting Brahms first. It's really exciting. He also speeds up quite a bit after the initial presentation of the, the big tune in the finale. 
when the tutti comes in. You know, Brahms marks marks it like animato or something, and it's one of those 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 points of comparison that we critics like to make and say, you know, moralistic things about, you know, if the guy speeds up too much, oh, it's so vulgar, he just takes off like a shot at the animato or pew vivo or whatever it is, I don't remember. And and some people say, oh, it's so great, it's exciting. He takes off like a shot at the animato. Well, I like both. I like it both ways. It all depends on the entire movement, the conception, and how well the conductor can get away with it. And, and Quinter Vaughn, ah, he gets away with it. He really gets away with it. So this is a wonderful Brahms cycle and a wonderful Brahms first. But you see, I'm already starting to talk about cycles again, you know, instead of the individual work. And that's just inevitable because they're, they're all coming in boxes. And there, there's very little I can do about that. So I, I apologize, but that's the way it's got to be. Now we have to talk about... <sighs> Fort Wengler, because Fort Wengler was a, a, a fabulous Brahms conductor. He really was. And uh, the, the sad thing is, the really sad thing is that Fort Wengler never made a Brahms cycle. I mean, under reasonably controlled conditions. It, was, uh, it wasn't recorded. It, well, you didn't do it live. You didn't do it. He, all of his recordings of Brahms, or most of them, are... are are live recordings. He did do some studio recordings that weren't very good. You know, with Fort Wengler, it's just a hit and miss thing. It always is with him. And when he hits, he's fabulous. He hits so rarely that, you know, Fort Wengler fans are likely to say that those rare hits are the most incomparable, cosmic, fabulous things that have ever been done in the history of the universe. They aren't. They're just hits. They're great. They're not greater than the other great things that we're talking about, but they're great. They're very great. And the Brahms first was lucky. It was lucky in several respects. First of all, there is, there is his best, um, or best sounding in any case, Berlin Philharmonic recording on Deutsche Grammophon. That's here. That's in the, those Fort Fingler boxes that have been coming out recently. Um, but it's, it's not in, you know, all of his recordings made for release. It's, I don't know if it's in the EMI box. I don't have the patience to go through all that crap and try and find it. DG did a Fort Fingler box fairly recently. This is a typical exemplar which contains the Brahms First Symphony coupled to Beethoven's Grossa Fuga, which lasts 18 absolutely interminable minutes. That's, that's a whole other issue. But this Brahms First is, is marvelous. Fort Fengler's Brahms first was incandescent at its best. And, and if you're, so if you're looking for like sort of the standard Fort Fengler Brahms first and good sound, this is the one to get. It's mono, of course, but it's, it's quite listenable and decent. It dates from, I think, what was it 1952? I looked it up. It's about 52, I think. So that's one of the ones to consider with him. But the other one, the one that, you know, Fort Fengler writes always freak out about is this one's in this, this box the Tara um, legendary concerts after the war. Now, Tara no longer exists. So presumably, these legendary concerts after the war are floating around on, on other labels or other ways to get them. But the one that I'm talking about here is right here. It's with the, the NDR, the Symphony Orchestra des Norddeutschen Rundfunks, the same NDR that we have over here with Gunter Vaughn. Here is that? That's right. Yeah. Here they are. There they are again. Same bunch. Remember, Brahms came from Hamburg. The Hamburgers, you know, they know what they're doing in Brahms. And this one um, is fabulous. It's from, it's from. Let's see. What, what's the date here? Uh, it's it's. What's the tenth month? It's it's, it's in Roman numerals. So it's making me crazy. October twenty seventh, nineteen fifty one. Very good sound, and it's it is the most exaggerated, but successfully exaggerated, of all the Fort Wengler recordings. You know, it always strikes me as funny. It's, it's, it, it's, it's wonderful. It has a, a mad timpanist in it who goes completely nuts, and it, it's thrilling. It's absolutely thrilling. But you know what always sort of amazed me about these Fort Wengler recordings is that, you know, because he was German and because he had the philosophical apparatus dripping from him at every point, People say, well, you know, it's all transcendental and amazing and wonderful. If Stokowski had done the things that Fort Fengler does in Brahms, 
you, you know, he would have just been called vulgar, showman, trashy, shallow. <laughs> but when Fort Wengler does it, oh, it's incandescent. It just goes to show how stupid we are when we talk about music and when we try and find words to characterize it and how much the way we characterize it is, is, is colored by totally non-musical considerations. Fort Wengler's Brahms is just as pulled about and exaggerated and, and rewritten and as grotesque as anything Stokowski did on his worst days. Often is not, and never is well played never as well executed. But Fort Fingler gets credit for being, you know, a, a mystical apostle of German whateverness. And Stokowski is just the guy who shook hands with Mickey Mouse. It's not right. We need to simply judge it by what we hear and call it for what it is. And so the the Fort Wengler Brahms one, at least the one in Hamburg, is, is wild. It's out there. That's what people love about it. But, you know, is it more profound because of that? Peh, don't bullshit me. It's ridiculous. Anyway, Fort Fingler's Brahms first is one of his great, great conceptions. And you really, it's really fair to say that you, you don't know the work until you've heard this particular conception because it's that, it's important and it's brilliant. And, and when it worked, it was, it was thrilling, absolutely thrilling. So, yes, go for Fort Fingler. Give him a break, or I will. Next, oh, another sort of Fort Wengler, someone who doesn't get credit for being, you know, as exciting and passionate and spontaneous as Fort Wengler, but who really was, Shaw Munch. Now, Munch also never got an entire Brahms cycle under his belt in Boston. The third is missing. That may be a good thing. Who knows? Anyway, his Brahms first with Boston's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. It's an RCA living stereo thing. It's in the big Munch box, and it's in this smaller box called Charles Munch Conducts Romantic Masterworks, Brahms, Mendelssohn, Schubert, and Schumann. And there are actually two boxes. There's another one that's like, you know, Munch is still conducting Romantic Masterworks from a slightly later date. So, you know, those are there too. But I really love his Brahms with the BSO. Remember, remember, always remember, Munch was concertmaster of the Gewandhaus in Leipzig, you know, under, under Fortfengler and Bruno Walter and all those people. And God knows, having come from Strasbourg and speaking German, you know, or, or Strasbourgeois, Alsatian, you know, as his native tongue, he was as, as effective and as idiomatically predisposed toward German music as anybody. And he actually had quite a feel for those qualities that we tend to regard as transcendental and spiritual in German music. I mean, he was a major Bach guy, you know, Munch was. He didn't get a chance to record that much of it. I mean, like the passions and the things he really would have liked to have recorded, because RCA would never, never do such a thing, especially with a conductor who they were positioning as the major French guy. But um, that was his... That was his great love, and his Brahms is also superb, absolutely superb. You know, it's always all, all one of those things, too. We all know that French people do German music better than German people, but the opposite isn't true. <laughs> I think that's kind of, kind of intriguing, but there you go. At least I'm throwing that out there for you to, to, for you to chew over you know, now and again. So the, the Munch Boston Brahms first is just, is just thrilling. It's a wonderful performance. It's impulsive and it's, it's, it's big boned and it's, it's just wonderfully, wonderfully powerful. And I enjoy it very much. And completely on the other end of the universe, Charles Munch. Charles Munch, that was Charles Munch. This is Charles McCarris, <laughs> this other Charles. Sorry about Charles McCarris with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra doing Brahms first. Now, this series of Brahms symphonies, a, a while ago, there was supposedly a Brahms style in the tradition of the Mining and Court Orchestra, which, which was, um, you know, the orchestra that premiered a lot of these symphonies and that played them, and that was a very small group. And Brahms... Brahms tended to prefer large orchestras 
But if he couldn't get a large orchestra to do it the way he wanted to, and he wanted to hear his music regularly, he was more than happy to let Meiningen do it. And Meiningen had Hans von Bülow conducting, and also Richard Strauss later, who at the beginning of his career anyway, was a huge Brahms aficionado, but also a conductor whose name was Fritz Steinbach. And Steinbach's style has been the source of an enormous amount of discussion and controversy in the performance practice of Brahms symphonies. It was a very free style from what we understand. Things with, with you know, a lot of speeding up and slowing down and, and fascinating things. And Steinbach's style was supposedly encapsulated in a typescript um, uh, by a guy named, named, named Bloom, which I happen to have a copy of sitting over, over in Connecticut and which I have read very, very carefully. And this typescript tells you literally, you know, bar by bar what Steinbach supposedly did or what this style was in performing the Brahms symphonies. Now, the great exemplar of that style that lived to make recordings was Hermann Abendroth. And Abendroth's Brahms is very, very interesting, and there's quite a bit of it circulating around. And it's not going to appear, I think, in these talks for a variety of reasons, um, because I'm generally not doing historical recordings so much, but it may be the subject of a separate discussion if I can organize enough of it and see what happens, because it is very, very interesting to hear. And that kind of flexibility of pulse and all that stuff you hear in some modern recordings. I mean, Eschenbach does it as well, but with what I consider to be an absolutely excessive amount of heaviness and panting and drooling. And Brahms doesn't really survive the spittle approach as far as I'm concerned. But that's not the point. This is what Macaris does. Macaris has taken that typescript, as he so often did, and he has tried to reproduce what might have been a mining in style Steinbachish performance of the Brahms symphonies here. Now, none of that would matter. A bunch of people did this about this time, by the way, when these were coming out. It was like a, a big, you know, one of those 15 minutes of fame period performance fads. None of that would matter if the conductor is not a great conductor by him or herself. And I mean that. You can't just you know, phone in your performance by saying, okay, we're going to do fast here, slow there, because I'm following the, the rules, the owner's manual, as it were. No, 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 no. And McCarris, of course, was a conductor of genius, a conductor of incredible innate musicality at all times. And so these are wonderful Brahms performances all by themselves, apart and aside from the historical performance practice aspects of them. They are light, Obviously, in texture, you hear all of the woodwind parts. They, they make a wonderful case for Brahms's, you know, sometimes thick and ungainly orchestration. And uh, they're wonderful performances. They really are. And they're very different because of this approach that Macaris is taking, which how authentic it is and how realistic it was and what really happened on the day. All of those, we have no idea. We have no idea, but there has been a tremendous amount of scholarly ink spilled over the question of the mining and style and Steinbach and all of these people and von Bülow and what they did and what Brahms wanted. And, oh, it just goes on endlessly. It's enough to make you sick. But this isn't. This is just refreshing, interesting Brahms. And if you've listened to all of this heavy-duty sort of German stuff, you're going to really enjoy this cycle because it's a completely refreshing change of pace. On the other hand, if you think that that's the only way to do it, you're going to hate this because it's a really refreshing change of pace. And some people don't like refreshing changes of pace. I do. I think they're terrific, especially when they're done as well as they are here with, I mean, Telarc's recording, stunning sonics. It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. So, Macaris. Also, here's a Brahms singleton performance that is amazing. There is a cycle. It's part of a cycle, but there are singleton releases, thank goodness, because most of the rest of them are not very good. Ivan Fischer, Ivan Fischer with the Budapest Festival Orchestra. Now, when this came out, 
when this came out, I was thrilled. I thought, oh my goodness, because here's a, was a Brahms cycle again that has its own point of view. It has an orchestra playing just magnificently. It's gloriously recorded by Channel Classics. It's coupled with, well, you get a Hungarian dance and, and the Haydn variations. Just a magnificent performance. I mean, it really, really is, especially the finale, which is, uh, it just goes, it goes like, like God made it. It's, it's stunning, stunning performance. The other ones that came out subsequently were much, much less successful. And I am not sure why. This is one of those performances that proves that you should quit while you're ahead. If you've got an absolutely great interpretation of a great work in you, do it. But don't fall for the doctrine that says, well, we must do a cycle. Or because one is great, the other three are going to be great. They weren't. They weren't horrible, but they weren't anywhere near as good as this first. But this first is one of the great ones. I am absolutely convinced of that. And if you're looking for a really excellent singleton first that doesn't involve getting a whole nother cycle of things, then give this one a shot because it really will add something wonderful to your collection and you won't have to go and listen to the other, th other three symphonies. And that's really, I think, a wonderful thing. So this gets props not only for being a great performance, but for being a great performance available separately, which is so rare these days. So Ivan Fischer, the Budapest Festival Orchestra, it's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Now we have my top one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, a half dozen or so, but they are spread amongst um, four conductors, not a half dozen. Number one, Giolini. Oh, my Giolini's Brahms first. This is the Los Angeles one. This is one of Dave's faves. And, you know, I, you, you might say, well, it's, it's your favorite. Why isn't it your however choice? And the reason I've explained many times is that I try to distinguish between things that I personally love and feel fuzzy and warm about and like, and what I consider to be the greatest performance of the work, or the one that I think is the most important for, you know, the normal listener, um, rather than the crazy, like psychotic critic type, you know, listener <laughs> to experience. I think this is one of the great Brahms for us ever. Giolini's Brahms cycle, I mean, he did three of them, um, or two and a half of them, and he did one and two in Los Angeles, and they are fantastic. Others prefer his original first, you know, with, on EMI, which is also quite, quite good. Then he remade them all in Vienna toward the end of his life. Not as good. Not as good as any of his earlier ones. That they, yeah, they go out there. No, no, no. But this first is the, the heavy-duty, granitic, grand Brahms first carried to its ultimate extreme. It really is. Even Fort Wengler sounds a little bit small scale next to this, especially because Giolini does the exposition repeat in the first movement. So, wow, it, it's, it's just one of those overwhelming experiences that I, I can't even listen to it, you know, most frequently when I want to hear the Brahms first. It's when I want to hear the Brahms first and need to take an afternoon to recover <laughs> from the experience. And Brahms is not usually a composer. You, we give credit for having that kind of intensity. He does with Fortfangler, for example, and he does with Cellini in this performance. And it is magnificently played and stunningly recorded. And I talked about it as a Dave's fave, so I don't think I need to go into it more here. Here it's in the Cellini in America box. It's in the big Cellini box. It's, it was originally issued singly, of course. It's still available, I think, in Japan singly, which was probably the best way to get it. But it is unbelievably one of the absolutely one of the most unbelievably great Brahms first and one of the great Cellini recordings. So there you go. Cellini is definitely in my top few. Also in my top few, and we, this can go either way, James Levine. James Levine's Brahms is one of the great unspoken fabulosities of the discography. And I'm not quite sure why they don't get talked about, aside from the fact that James Levine is now in disgrace and doesn't get talked about as much as he should have been. Well, he gets talked about, but for the wrong reasons. But his Brahms was always a knockout. 
It really was. I mean, it's tremendous. He was also, by the way, a Zell acolyte who delivers, I think, Zell-like performances, which are absolutely unparalleled in terms of transparency and precision and energy and dynamics and all of those things. And he does them better than Zell did, in my view. Anyway, there are two Levine Brahm cycles, which are equally superb. One is with the Chicago Symphony, which is just, just unbelievably fabulous. And it's here on RCA. And the other was with the Vienna Philharmonic, which was done later in gorgeous digital sound, fabulously recorded. And it's almost, it's really the apotheosis of what the Vienna Philharmonic should sound like in Brahms. It is a much richer sound than we hear in the Chicago versions. I, I can't choose. I adore this just for its sonic opulence. And the interpretations are very, very similar. They're just as taut and just as mesmerizing. Um, but I really, really like the leaner sonority of the Chicago Symphony and a lot of this music because Brahms doesn't need any help in the cushy department. Brahms is always very rich sounding because his orchestration favors big, well padded and heavily upholstered string writing. So I, I, I kind of I kind of tend to like the Chicago performances until I hear the Vienna performances when I'm completely won over. But Levine is one of the great Brahmsians, and I've talked about this in discussing the symphony cycles, and I'm going to have to talk about these with every one of the symphonies because they're all great. But the first is Dynamite. It really is in both versions. They're just fantastic performances because the conception is wonderful. And as I said, when these people have a wonderful conception of all of the symphonies, then all of the symphonies are going to be equally great as part of that conception. If we get lucky and the conductor was on for all of them, Levine was on for all of them in both of these Brahms cycles. It was one of his greatest achievements as a conductor, maybe his greatest overall, really just a knockout pair of Brahms cycles. And I, I, they're amazing. They're just amazing. And the first is, is, is one of the great firsts because the whole cycle is one of the great cycles. So we talk about that. And similarly, we have to say the same things about Jochum. Jochum is another one of the great unsung Brahms conductors because he is so heavily favored as a Bruckner conductor as, for example, Gunter Vond was. But Jochum is even better in Brahms, I think. Jochum's Brahms is, is stunning, absolutely stunning. And you get it two different ways. You get it with the Berlin Philharmonic in mono, or mostly in mono, is some of it in stereo? I, I, I don't remember, but I, I think it's all in mono. It's all in mono um, on DG. Or you can get it on EMI with the uh, London Philharmonic. Either way. Either way, it is absolutely wonderful. Oh, this is the one that has the fourth in the German Requiem. But there, there were two EMI twofers. And then up here over there is the big uh, Jochum box that has all of his EMI recordings or Warner recordings now. So you get the Staatskapelle Dresden Bruckner cycle and you get the Brahms cycle and you get the Beethoven cycle and you get the Bach B minor mass and some Mozart stuff. And that was his entire, his entire discography recorded for Warner, or originally EMI. Jochum's Brahms is, you know, he was called, you know, mini Fortfängler, but he was really much better as a conductor than Fortfängler ever was. He was better technically, he was just as fine interpretively. You have, like Fortfängler, that same passion, the spontaneity, the flow, the organic conception of each piece, but Jochum doesn't blow any of the symphonies. And he would always get the orchestra to play the damn music, unlike Fortwängler. So it really, really was just great. And I have I know, since I've been doing these videos, I've been pushing these Jochum recordings of, of Brahms. And some of you have went and have gone and listened to them. And the result has been very, very gratifying because you cannot go wrong with this guy. He was a thrilling thrilling Brahms conductor, someone who just, again, he had, he had the music in his blood and, and he conducts each work as an organic whole, a total, a total oneness of everything. It's just magnificent. And these London Phil ones are not worse than the Berlin Phil ones. They really aren't. I mean, they are wonderfully recorded. They sound beautiful and the orchestra plays plays their hearts out. And you know, the London Phil actually was a very good Brahms orchestra because Adrian Bolt 
did a lot of Brahms. His, his performances of the symphonies were actually rather slovenly. I think that he, he did, Bolt was not a disciplinarian. He didn't, you know, insist on the kind of strictness that the music required, except in the serenades, which are fabulous, by the way. But, you know, I mean, some people like his, his Brahms cycle. I don't. I just find it too slack. But, you know, but the orchestra really knew how to play the music. They knew that style. They'd done it for forever. And so when Joachim came trundling in and, and applied a certain, you know, Teutonic discipline, but also Fort Wenglerian flexibility and transcendental, whatever the hell you want to call it, the result was magnificent. So Joachim is a Brahms guy that you've got to hear, and his first is magnificent, as you might expect. Really, really stunning. However, well, we finally come to the end. I'm hitting the 50 minute mark in this video, which is more than long enough. It's as long as most performances of the Brahms first, and actually longer than a lot of them. If you take the exposition repeat, you might get this far. And I have to say, my performance of choice of a lifetime of forever is Klemperer. I know you've been waiting to see if I would mention him or not. Klemperer's Brahms first is for so many, and for me, the essence of what the music ought to be. It really is. But, you know, we say that and, and as though it's somehow typical. It's not typical. It's, it's very personal to Klemperer. It has, you know, Klemperer's style is always called granitic, like granite. And this is granitic. This is the definition of granitic, but it's not slow. It's not heavy because Klemperer was always able to aerate the texture with the very, very forward placement of the woodwinds. He liked, he was an unsentimental conductor. He was really a contemporary conductor. Remember, he had all those years at the Kroll Opera where he did modern music. He, he liked to do Bach with no vibrato. I mean, he was, he was that wasn't, by the way, anything had nothing to do with authenticity. It had to do with Hindemith's Neue Sachlichkeit, the new objectivity, the aesthetic of neoclassicism that happened in music around the 1920s and 30s, and which the period instrument movement has claimed to have invented is some sort of authentic nonsense when the fact is we've all been there before. But Klemperer's Brahms really is special. He grew up in the style. He was there when Brahms was still alive. He was from Hamburg, as Brahms was. He was a North German. I don't know if any of those things make any difference. All I know is that this Brahms first is one of the great statements in, in all of recorded music. It doesn't ever set a foot wrong. He's got the Philharmonia playing at the very top of its game. The, the recording is incredibly powerful sonically. And from the opening note, that opening timpani stroke, that bong, dong, you know, it, it, you just know it makes the music sound special. And that's what we want in any performance, isn't it? Ultimately, we want the music to sound like it's the greatest thing that was ever written and that what we're about to hear is important and meaningful and powerful and compelling. And Klemperer is all of those things. And so your Brahms first collection has to start, I think, with Klemperer on Warner. And it's available, and it was in this box, and there was a Klemperer edition where there's a box of Brahms. All of his Brahms is worth hearing. It's all very, very good. The fourth has a couple of, like, you know, quirky bits, but that's okay. He was entitled to have a quirky bit now and then. This first is really, really stunning. And it's my, it's my however choice. It, you know, my fave may be the Giolini, but I got news for you. I listen to this one just as often. I really do. I mean, I respect it just as much. I love it just as much. Um, if it's not my personal favorite, it's because I have certain of my own quirky things that I look for or enjoy listening to now and again. But wow. It doesn't come any better than this. It really doesn't. I can say it both personally and objectively that this is the Brahms first to end all Brahms firsts. And so I think it's the logical place to conclude this extremely long conversation of a bunch of the best Brahms first symphonies. I now turn it over to you, my friends. Thank you for joining me and for surviving this long. Keep on listening. Take care.